OK, welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure as a convener of the Loughborough University Nationalism to um, uh, introduce Professor Gassan Hajj. Uh, Gassan Hajj is a professor of anthropology at the University of Melbourne, Australia. He's also a senior research fellow at the Max Planck Institute of Social Anthropology in Halle, Germany, where he's presently based. So he's actually speaking from Germany, not from Australia at the moment. And he's the author of many works, uh, any books as well, more, many books. But in particular, there is a, a book that, uh, because of the Loughborough University Nationalism Network, we are particularly keen to hear from. And that is the book that he published in 1998, is White Nation. Now, exactly this week, a new book has just uh, been published. It's titled the, Russia, the Racial Politics of Australian Multiculturalism. And this book is actually made of three parts. The, the, the first part is a um, reproduction of White Nation, the book that was published in 1998. The second part is against paranoid nationalism, another book that was published in 2003. And the third part is a uh, material which has not been published before and analyzes again uh, the intersection between Australian multiculturalism and nationalism. The book is just out this week, so this is a call for everybody. Look for the book. <laughs> and obviously, I'm sure it's going to be um, a very interesting uh, reading. I should say that um, the talk is co organized with also the Leiden University Nationalism Network, uh, the Nationalis uh, Nationalism Studies at Edinburgh University, and the Nationalism Studies Program at the Central European University. Uh, the talk is going to be uh, recorded and my invitation is for everybody, please, to keep the uh, camera uh, closed. And at the end, we are aiming for about 40 minutes talk uh, and after 40 minutes, there will be time for Q&A. Uh, please keep the camera and the microphone closed and the floor is for Gassan. Thank you very much, Gassan. Thank you, Marco, and thank you very much, uh, all of you, for inviting me. And uh, indeed, uh, as, as you mentioned, it seems like a particularly appropriate moment uh, to revisit uh, White Nation, given given its uh, republication. It's actually its 25th uh, anniversary, as, as uh, it happened. And uh, often, often I get asked, uh, sort of like how does it feel the fact that uh, the book is still read uh, 25 years uh, later and uh, I almost equally ritualistically uh, answer that I feel very ambivalent that a book which is partly perceived that is kind of like perceived itself at least as part of the struggle against uh, sort of like forms of national chauvinism and the rise of extreme right is still relevant because it basically shows that it uh, didn't really, uh, that the struggle is still going on uh, and that in fact uh, we have experienced more a sense of defeat uh, rather than the sense of success in fighting uh, extreme right-wing uh, white uh, nationalism. And so it's a good opportunity to try and think, given the rise of extreme right and all the rise of kind of like white nationalism uh, in general, uh, to, to, to think what are, uh, at least to my mind, uh, some of the key uh, points that I develop in white nation and that I feel are still of uh, relevance uh, to, to thinking think in our, our present. So uh, the, first, the first thing I introduce in uh, White Nation, which is part of its title, is the idea of uh, the white national fantasy. And it's basically this idea of what is a national uh, fantasy. And uh, I often introduce the concept of uh, fantasy 
by telling my students, well, look around you. Have you ever seen a nationalist who is a happy person? And the fact is sort of like nationalism is often a kind of like mode of whinging, uh, sort of like mode of uh, showing being dissatisfied, uh, saying that something is lacking uh, in in the nation because uh, through uh, through nationalism, uh, the nationalists give themselves a job, uh, a reason to exist. Uh, we're saying my nation is not good enough because there's too many migrants or because too many people are on the door or because the borders are open or uh, whatever reason. But the important thing is that with nationalism, the nationalists give themselves a reason to exist. And they exist in order to achieve the nation that they desire. And so you will never find a happy nationalist because the moment the nationalist is happy, they say, well, I don't need to be a nationalist anymore and uh, there's no reason for me to exist. And this is the idea of a national fantasy. A fantasy uh, in this psychoanalytic sense is a kind of like frame which, in which one constructs one's own uh, significance. And for me, nationalism is, is such a fantasy. And uh, insofar as some people have white nationalist fantasies, uh, these are fantasies not just of uh, the nationalist being uh, of significance, but the white nationalist being uh, of significance. Now, it's an interesting debate that I initiated in white nation, whether a white nation fantasy is primarily a form of nationalism or racism. Uh, so it matters a lot whether we are talking about a racist nationalism or a full-fledged racism. My argument was that you don't have too many people fantasizing about their race anymore. At least that was the idea in, 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 in when I wrote the book. The idea that, uh, you know, it's the, the, the people we call racist today are often people who make pronouncements about how they want their nation to be. They don't make pronouncement about how they want their race to be. Uh, the, object of, the object of their fantasy is a nation that is really good, not a race that is really good. That is why some of them are genuinely convinced that they are not racist. When you tell them that you're racist, they say, no, I'm not racist, uh, etc. So we have these endless debates uh, where we try to convince them otherwise, but they're genuinely convinced they are not racist. They don't have fantasies of race as such. But crucial to the fantasy, nonetheless, is the idea of a white central uh, subject. And I think that that is still a very important thing to think with. Uh, what I call a white subject with a sense of governmental belonging. I think that notion of governmental belonging uh, has had a good trajectory since I published the book, and I still think it has uh, quite a lot of relevance. Governmental belonging, and uh, uh, it's a more a phenomenological category rather than a category of government in the sense of it is about how people feel they belong uh, in, in the nation. And uh, governmental belonging is when you feel that you are entitled to worry, as I, as I said, about the nation. It's up to you. I worry about my nation. I, I feel it is legitimate. I'm entitled to it. If, uh, uh, if someone just enters 
enters your nation, let's say you are, you are in, uh, in England and a French person arrives and says, uh, uh, I think uh, you guys uh, are sort of like, uh, sort of like not doing, not, uh, not doing very well uh, the way uh, you are handling uh, a sort of like unemployment benefit. People say, well, who are you? You are not entitled to this. You are not entitled to make statements about how we should run our country. The, so governmental belonging is how people convince themselves that, yes, they have the right, they are entitled to think. Whether they actually have the power to govern is a, a completely different, <laughs> different thing, because often uh, the people who have a sense of uh, governmental belonging are usually quite marginalized white people who don't have that much power in society, but they, in a way, uh, kind of like, uh, yeah, sort of like, instead of having a lot of power, they have fantasies of power uh, that allow them to think they make, they can make uh, pronouncements. Um, and today, what makes it uh, even more relevant is that uh, people with white fantasies, even though they don't have uh, much power, uh, they can fill uh, social media uh, with their presence. And uh, before, before they used to have their own little circles, and today they, they have social media, so they have a much bigger presence in which they can make simply pronouncements. You don't have to actually be in government or even close to government or be educated. All you have to do is feel strongly entitled to say, we don't want this, we want that. Uh, and I think, uh, I mean, it's pretty, pretty deeply ingrained the notion of an entitlement white fantasy, a white, white governmental uh, belonging. Uh, what I tried to show in White Nation that this is much more important than people who are, for instance, tolerant or intolerant, uh, sort of like the, the classical dualism that at least in Australia was very important between people who are tolerant and acceptant of migrants and people who are intolerant and don't want migrants. Uh, and my argument was that both the tolerant and the intolerant still thought that it was up to them whether others existed in the nation uh, or not. I mean, I had a pretty interesting conversation uh, last week between uh, two uh, white English uh, people from London, London people, and they were basically saying how saying we, we have become really good because we have so many colored politicians and uh, in, in the UK. And it was quite interesting because I was thinking, okay, so who is the we who is really good here? Uh, who has become, it's uh, the, so, uh, the, even though the fantasy is saying there's uh, colored people in, in the UK who are prime ministers, etc., but these people still assume that it is a white we that is doing really well because there is a uh, sort of like colored uh, prime minister, etc. So, so the white, white governmental fantasy is not necessarily a fantasy of nasty racists who want to get rid of everything. It's just people who think it's, it's, they are the center of decision making. It's up to them uh, whether the nation is this way or that way. Uh, and in white nations, especially, I highlight the fact that it's up to them, to, they fantasize it's up to them to direct the traffic, as it were, in the nation. Uh, how many people can come in, who can come in? Uh, yes, uh, 5,000 5, migrants is really good, but 10,000 is too much. Uh, I mean, people sort of like fantasize that they may they can make decisions about things which they don't know much really about. Even, even experts, if you like, who spend a lot of time researching to try and work out what's economically good as far as how many migrants should enter, would have lots of debate. But 
For such people, it doesn't matter. They can make a statement. I, I think I like to have 10,000 nice items, whatever. That's all right. And they have debates like this uh, among them. And so, uh, the third, <coughs> the, 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 the fourth thing that I uh, developed in White Nation, which I think is uh, quite crucial, is uh, the notion of identification as a form of uh, cultural accumulation of cultural capital. Uh, it is always a part of a nationalist discourse to come out with statements such as are you or are you not in the sense of are you Australian or are you not uh, are you English or are you not are you this or are you not uh, and the idea is that, well, the idea is that it is an either or thing. Uh, one is either Italian or not Italian. One is either French or not French. And uh, this idea is uh, actually obviously true as far as citizenship is concerned, because you either have the papers or you don't have the papers. But in terms of cultural politics, it's much more uh, complicated and interesting because even the people who might be talking to someone to tell them, well, you're not French, I'm French, or given a choice, have arguments among each other about more or less. I, I would say, I'm actually more French than you are. Uh, and so this idea, I, I try to analyze how people sort of like, how modes of identification are culturally uh, modes of more or less. And uh, to do so, I uh, mobilized uh, Pierre Bourdieu's notion of field and of capital. And I try to argue that all forms of na cultural national identification involve a mode of accumulating national identity, a national identity capital, so to speak. Uh, and uh, as with uh, Pierre Bourdieu's notion of capital, there's always a struggle over what it is to accumulate. Uh, the value of what is to be accumulated, who can accumulate more or less. So, uh, I try to show that whiteness is not at all a question of color uh, in, in Australia. That in fact, the color white, whatever that color means, uh, is itself subject to people who think I'm more white than you are. Uh, but what I try to show is that actually people, for instance, can accumulate and as you would call convert, they can accumulate Christianity and convert it into whiteness. So I try to show how, how some Christian Lebanese uh, in Australia sort of like emphasize wearing the cross uh, and uh, the importance of the cross for them is not to show simply that they are Christian, but that, they, that their Christianity makes them more Australian or legitimately so than Muslims, for instance. And so they convert their Christianity to uh, whiteness. Uh, you can convert your accent to whiteness. Uh, you can convert how you walk, how you talk, there's endless debates. Is it Australian? Is it more to drink beer uh, or to drink uh, wine? Uh, so it is, uh, and, and it's endlessly before sort of like, uh, it used to be sort of like beer is a quintessential drink that makes you 
uh, Australian, then people came and said, so flaca, this is so cliche and old fashioned uh, Australia now with a much more uh, chic and cosmopolitan nation. Uh, drinking beer is what we do. But now we have a reverse where boutique beer has taken over, <laughs> taken over uh, from one. So it is a cultural struggle of how people accumulate nation is continuously uh, changing and people uh, have sort of like competitions and etc. Uh, around that. Now, one of the important things that I introduce in White Nation and that I feel has been uh, probably one of, for me at least, has, has been a most uh, continuously uh, productive uh, has been the, the, the study of the way uh, middle class Australians convert their capacity for tolerance into higher morality converting your capacity to tolerance into higher, uh, higher morality. What I mean by this is that there are obviously uh, class differences in uh, the ability of Australians to be uh, open to other cultures. Uh, this openness to other cultures, uh, like, like for instance, to cuisine or, or to, 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 uh, to, to, to other rituals or, uh, or to cultural habits, uh, is often linked to, to uh, degrees of cultural capital, educational capital, uh, economic capital. But there's something about middle class people that often want them not to say that their attitude is what it is because of the social position they are in, and rather to say their attitude is what it is because they have a higher morality. So uh, if I am open to others, uh, if I'm arguing, I want more refugees. Uh, if I want, I'm arguing, there should be less racism. Uh, if I don't feel threatened uh, by, by, by migrants, uh, all of this, I don't say, actually, I don't feel threatened by migrants because well, they really don't threaten me because I'm well, or actually, I, I don't, they don't threaten me because I've got enough uh, ways of thinking that I, I, I actually think they enrich my being, uh, blah, blah, blah. And so instead, instead people <coughs> use a language of morality and, uh, and often condemn people who uh, are not of the same uh, sort of like dispositions uh, on on social grounds, and therefore uh, the debate between racists and non-racists becomes a moralistic debate uh, between people who are supposedly uh, with high moral and people who are accused of being low moral, which has always seemed to me generated a very bad uh, politics as far as it's not to argue that the people who are not racist are not racist, or that, that the people who are racist are racist. It's just that when this division between nationalist racist and nationalist non-racist is made into a moral, moral sort of like a conflict, uh, it creates a form of resentment on the part of people with less cultural capital, less etc., because they feel uh, they are being pontificated on and uh, sort of like spoken to uh, from above. 
And uh, in, in a way, this, this kind of politics has fed a lot uh, the rise of uh, the extreme right, uh, which uh, works a lot on digesting forms of class humiliation and making them into uh, kind of like uh, sublime politics. Another important issue as far as racism is concerned that I dealt with in White Nation has to do with, with uh, what I call the, uh, well, the relationship between uh, racism and the comparative mobility. My investigation of the white, of the white Hansonites uh, led to some interesting things about fantasies of what I, what I later at in the book, but then I developed it even more about what I call uh, uh, sentiment of stuckness, the feeling that you are stuck. Uh, at the time when I wrote uh, White Nation, uh, there was uh, a bit of a, a disaster in a snow resort in Australia where there was a landslide which demolished, uh, demolished these uh, skiing chalets. And uh, this person uh, got stuck by a concrete slab. Uh, as part as part of the disaster, and uh, he survived. He was the sole the sole survivor from from that slide. And it was quite interesting because I was doing my research among the nationalists, and I could see the incredible identification that they had with uh, this person. And it slowly dawned on me how much the sentiment of being stuck socially was uh, pre prevalent uh, among them. And once I had uh, this intuition, I started to see empirical traces of it in all, all uh, kind of uh, interesting ways. For instance, I was struck by the degree to which uh, the racism that the people I was working with were expressing towards Asian doctors and nurses was so much more extreme than other as a form of racism. And I was often puzzling about this. Why this? They kind of like saying, "What is this? I go, I go to a hospital." And you know, I'm treated by, by a Chinese doctor, I'm treated by an Indian doctor, uh, the nurses are, uh, and there's a kind of like, and I, I thought initially that this was just simply a kind of like uh, a loss of the whiteness of the hospital, and that they are kind of like fantasizing about a white hospital. But uh, it soon became quite clear to me that uh, the object of affect was not just the white hospital. It was the fact that uh, doctors and nurses, physicians, were actually uh, positions that have traditionally been fantasies of upward social mobility. Uh, you know, you might not be a doctor yourself or a nurse, but you might, depending on when you are, you might fantasize about your children being nurses or your children being doctors. So it was part of the fantasy of upward, upward social mobility. And in some ways, uh, it became clear to me that uh, the object of resentment was not just that there was colored people in the hospital, it was that these colored people have, in a sense, filled the fantasy positions of these white people. That he then said, "What's going on? Who? How is my son or my daughter going to become a doctor? If this this black person or this this uh, Chinese person or whatever is uh, is occupying my area? So this is what I call the racism of of based on comparative uh, mobility, and 
and it, it, it you can see it like it was an example very very schematic uh, some some people like they have a car uh, which is not a very expensive car but it's okay car and uh, they live next to them moves a migrant family and this migrant family uh, the guy has a bicycle A year after, the guy who had a bicycle buys a motorbike. And the motorbike is nowhere near as good as the car. But you can see that what affects this form of racism is that this guy has moved from bike to motorbike and I'm still stuck where I am. This is why this notion of stuckedness becomes so much part of this nationalist uh, form of racist, uh, white nationalism. So it's comparative mobility. They're, they're moving, which means they're moving, they're on the move, they're gonna become better, uh, uh, sort of like they're gonna become the doctors and we're going to still stay. And, uh, you know, I didn't, uh, it was, I did not use statistics about about uh, sort of like uh, social mobility when I wrote the book, but all the statistics that I read after I wrote the book confirm this in terms of the movement of uh, social uh, social mobility. But uh, I think there's the other sort of like space that I explored uh, and which I developed a lot more uh, later has to do with um, the classification, the classification of, uh, of uh, asylum seekers, uh, migrants, etc. as uh, as a form of uh, reject that is arriving in Australia and that in fact we have nothing to do with it. We have nothing to do with it. Uh, this is something I developed later in uh, Is Racism and Environmental Threat, uh, which is a book I wrote uh, much later, but in, in this book already in White Nation, working on, on what I call, what I, in a chapter sort of like that dealt with, with ecological fantasies. It's uh, quite clear sort of like, uh, because I started uh, is racism and environmental threat by noticing that the language that the government was using to describe asylum seekers arriving by boat to Australia was incredibly similar to the language they were using to describe uh, a mass of plastic reject. You know, those oceans of plastic that move in sort of like in the Pacific, etc. And the idea is that Somebody produced these rejects, it's not us, and we have to deal, deal with it. And so there is one, uh, the denialism uh, that we are responsible in any way uh, for this is similar in ecological thinking and, and uh, in, in political thinking. Um, and there's also the idea that comes from this, which I probably would like to finish with. And that is the idea that it is incredible how many people still think that uh, racism 
is the crisis. That racism is the crisis. That is now what I mean by this is that you kind of like, if you look and see racism and say, oh, this is a blot on the national landscape. Your assumption is that racism is something that comes from the outside. It's a badness that, that the essential space of your nation is good and racism is a blot on this goodness. It is the crisis and therefore if you remove that badness the nation will recover its beauty and its uh, goodness. And this kind of like fantasy of the nation as essentially good uh, is, is kind of like part of a, the problem because it fails to see to what extent the racism is extrinsic, extrinsic and structural to uh, the nation itself. And I try to say so sort of like a, it's think of the absurdity of uh, someone uh, landing in the middle of a slave cotton plantation and looking and saying, oh, there's racism here. Uh, as if it is the problem. Well, racism in the plantation is not the problem, it's how the plantation works. Uh, the racialized state is not a problem. The problem is if racism stops working. That is, if, if slaves stop believing that they belong in a specific way, if, they, if the racism stops doing its governmental work, of positioning them and restricting them into specific places. That is the crisis. And I think it's very important for all of us to think that when we have a crisis in the West today, it's of a similar order. Uh, it's not racism that is the crisis. The crisis is that racism is no longer working. Uh, Racists are people who like their racism to work. They like to think, if I think you're inferior, I should think you're inferior. There's a crisis if you, you don't think you're inferior and say, actually, bullshit, I don't think I'm inferior. I don't think I belong. And so that is racism not doing its job. And uh, a lot of what we call crisis today is of that order. I think uh, racism uh, is no longer a very good technology of governmentality. Uh, it used to be a technology of governmentality uh, that allowed the nations to put down and locate certain people in certain positions and tell them, you belong here, not here. Not notice, not just you are, you belong outside the nation. It could be, as I said, said, you're welcome into my nation, but you belong here. Not, not in government, but you belong uh, in the factory or uh, uh, etc. So uh, the crisis today is that uh, this kind of like governmental racism uh, is no longer working. Uh, we had a kind of, yeah, a form of slave revolt, if you like, uh, generalized. And this is what affects extreme right people more than anything else. I think uh, extreme right nationalists have a slavery fantasy of racism. Uh, they like their racism to work. They like, they, and uh, they think it's up to them as we started by thinking, by saying, they think it's up to them to uh, reorder and uh, re-domesticate 
those who are running wild and uh, no longer domesticable. I think I'll stop here and take some uh, some questions. Thank you very much, Gassan, for this very rich talk. Um, uh, for the people in the audience, uh, the preference whether you, is if you have a camera, whether you open the camera, you open the microphone and ask the question rather than putting the question in the chat. Um, can I ask whether anyone has a question? And yeah, if you have a question, I do have a question right now, but yes, we do have people and then I can hold my questions. So Michael. Is Michael Ske is a I'm not sure whether you know is a we work together on everyday nationalism. Hello, Gassan. I just wanted to start with a, a thank you actually, because um way back in 2008, there was a slightly confused PhD student who didn't really know what he was doing with his PhD. And he picked up your book, White Nation, and it all kind of fell into place. So I'd I really like to say thank you for <laughs> helping me to sort my PhD out because it really made a big <laughs> difference. Um, but I, I mean, I have a question about to what extent you think the, your, the ideas from the book White Nation. I know it's, it's very much about the kind of intersection of, of race and nation, but to what extent do you, do you think some of your concepts apply to other parts of the world? I mean, in, in terms of governmental belonging, in terms of national cultural capital, can it can those ideas be applied outside of Australia, Britain, the United States of America? Can we apply them to places like China, to Japan, for example? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Michael, for the question. And thanks for telling me about the inspiring role of my book <laughs> in your in uh, your PhD. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely uh, I have had uh, a lot of uh, time over the years. When I wrote White Nation, I spent quite a bit of time in France working with Le Peniste, and I also spent a little bit of time in, in the US actually working with David Duke uh, and his mob. And sort of like I sort of like so that provided me with a kind of like comparative uh, basis. But at the same time, I have to kind of like say and you will notice it in White Nation, uh, that I sometimes uh, use Lebanon and some experiences I've had in Lebanon about racism of Christians towards Muslims in the history of Lebanon uh, too. And uh, it's quite an interesting thing because you see, uh, White Nation was my first book, uh, but it wasn't my PhD. Uh, my PhD was actually uh, on uh, Christian right-wing fighters in the Lebanese Civil War. And uh, I was actually uh, thinking the question of class versus religious belonging in Lebanon and the way Christians developed a mode of uh, racial, racializing themselves as superior sort of like uh, people. And uh, it was while I was working on, on Lebanon that I, uh, being in Australia, uh, kind of like, well, I mean, I suppose one instrumental way of saying it is that Lebanon, expertise in Lebanon didn't sell <laughs> in, uh, uh, in, in Australia. But I, I found it quite interesting using the categories that I was uh, de developing for my PhD, Lebanese PhD, and applying it to uh, the question of cultural pluralism in Australia. And I think part of, if I may say so, the originality of White Nation came from the fact that I took some of these categories and, and brought them. And after that, I had plenty of time to, to, to see. I mean, you, you see it today, uh, today. If you go to Lebanon and see the attitude towards Syrian refugees, uh, and you see uh, that it has, it is not necessarily that a white Western Western thing. But of course, uh, the history of colonialism and etc. gives 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 Western Western whiteness 
it kind of lacks specificity, but yeah, but not unique. Thank you, Gassan. Thank you, Michael, for the question. Any other questions from the room? Yeah, Nino. If you have a camera, if you want to open the camera, you open the microphone. Thank you. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, yes. Uh, Professor Hash, thank you very much for your fascinating talk. Finally, we meet somehow each other. Um, uh, to follow the last question, um, I have one small question and um, another is rather comment. And I start with comment. I think uh, we uh, perfectly can somehow broaden these uh, notions what uh, you are talking about. I'm thinking uh, um, uh, with examples in Europe, in Germany, I'm in Germany and I'm working with migrants from post-Soviet uh, space and a lot of things uh, you are mentioning somehow fits very well. I was thinking um, about this values convertible accumulating you, you mentioned this religious identity, and I was thinking, how about um, um, capitalist and socialist uh, way of life? So from, from the capitalist perspective, from German perspective, this is kind of um, capital, which is not capital, not good. It's somehow negatively perceived. Yes, that, that these people have this kind of experience of uh, post-socialist or socialist uh, way of uh, living and thinking and uh, uh, it's uh, thank you very much I will think about this convertibility uh, and possibility to convert it somehow and from both perspectives how it works uh, and uh, another um, uh, point um, regarding a labor market policy in Germany integration policy nobody would be named it as, uh, as a racism but I was stuck now with your concept uh, racism uh, and comparative mobility. What we have, what, what we can observe uh, already decades long in Germany, this is kind of the, not accepting the diplomas. And uh, maybe we, we should name it kind of uh, uh, also as kind of racism in this sense, because uh, if you are uh, doing this uh, cleaning job, it's okay. But if you if you are, as you say, doctor or, or academia, it's problem. Your diploma is not uh, accepted and you are not able, you are excluded. And if you are excluded from this nation's wealth and well-being and uh, uh, um, um, resources, can we say it's kind of art of uh, racism? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, first, uh, sort of like I think uh, it's uh, quite crucial to be flexible with the categories to be able to account for each uh, specificity. And uh, it is not always the case uh, that governments uh, don't want to give uh, doctors. It depends on the needs of the, how the government uh, classifies the needs of of the nation, and uh, and uh, and it's quite uh, uh, quite so in in white nation. I developed the notion of functional belonging, and uh, functional belonging, I argued, was a category that uh, the na nationalist give where they are. Um, quite happy to welcome people into the nation if they perform a function that they think is useful. Uh, but uh, the most common and obvious case of people who are given a functionalist, uh, such functions belonging are sports people. Uh, like you can be uh, racist as much as you like against uh, against the uh, Belarusian or, or, or what have you, and suddenly this uh, amazing athlete comes and says, well, I'm going to play for your Olympic team. So, okay, so welcome, and suddenly you're carrying, you're carrying the flag and uh, you become part of the nation. So, so it depends very much uh, on, on context. And the other interesting thing 
about the study of nationalism here is that, and that is part of what extreme right feed on, is that they actually don't think that the way government classify immigrants uh, works in alignment with the way they classify immigrants. They think uh, the governments are too lax or uh, they're allowing certain people uh, to, to, to become uh, Australian or, or German or whatever, and they shouldn't let them or, or what have you. So, so there is ne isn't necessarily uh, an agreement between them. And so you need to differentiate between uh, different uh, racisms. Uh, it's not that one is racist and sometimes Sometimes the racism of the government is very different from the racism of the mob, and how the two interact is, is, is itself an interesting problematic. Thank you, Hassan. Can I take, uh, yeah, can I ask a question myself while I wait maybe if there are other questions? So I'm particularly interested in the notion of the white fantasy and partly connecting with the question that Michael asked before. Um, but more on the white and um, um, my work is all about how children of migrants focusing on Italy they claim a sense of national belonging and by attending to those uh, voices I'm trying to understand if there is a room for a nation beyond the white nation and I wonder what you make of that and particularly given the fact that if you look at some of the literature, Paul Gilroy and uh, Stuart Hall, they maintain that there is a structural link between nationalism and racism. So in a sense, it is impossible to move away from race as a key component of the nation. And I'm using more the nation race rather than nationalism, racism. So I would like to have your views here. What are the chances to um, have a nation beyond the white fantasy and what to make of those claims of belonging of people that are part and parcel of the nation? They are not regarded by the white people, but yeah, what are the possibilities of a more inclusive plural nation? I I, I, I I I have no problem imagining it. <laughs> I have no problem imagining uh, post-white nation uh, nationalism. Uh, I have no problem even imagining a non-white multiculturalism. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm a very perspectivist in my uh, research. Uh, it's very crucial for me. Like uh, some people read white nation and say. Uh, white nation is about uh, multiculturalism in Australia, but it's not actually. It's about a specific experience of multiculturalism. It is a white experience of multiculturalism. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, uh, when I'm interviewing a white cosmopolitan person who says to me, uh, multiculturalism it's wonderful to be part of uh, Australian multiculturalism because I can eat uh, Indian and uh, Thai and uh, what have you. I don't say this is Australian multiculturalism because I know for a fact that I've interviewed a working class Greek immigrant who thinks multiculturalism is a victory uh, of, of, of uh, recognition uh, compared to his parents. Working class parents is part of what is or her parents struggled to achieve uh, in factories their greatness was not recognized and they fought for it to be recognized. And so on one hand, you have a history of multiculturalism, which is a history of struggle and realization. On the other, you have an experience of multiculturalism as a cosmopolitan consumption. So I'm, I don't say multiculturalism is this or that. Uh, multiculturalism are many experiences, but some come to dominate and define uh, of others. So because I think of dominant and dominated cultures rather than it is this or it is not that, uh, I have no problem thinking dominated forms of nationalism uh, that 
one can support and prop up and then can provide alternative non-racial forms uh, of nationalism. I sort of like don't have uh, a problem fantasizing it, <laughs> but uh, the problem I have is historical uh, in the sense that uh, the last 25 years of my life has seen an increased ethno-nationalistic tendencies uh, thriving uh, everywhere. And uh, sorry, on, on that, sorry, if I step in, don't you think that possibly this increasing of the ethno-racial understanding of the nation is actually a sort of um, anxiety response to the demographic change in a sense that the white uh, titular group, they see that their own group is demographically shrinking and that's why it's even more accentuated. So going forward, exactly because of demographic change, by default, white fantasy will become um, a minority. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, uh, I mean, I've actually, I make, I make that I, not a similar argument in, in white nation, what I call the multicultural real. Uh, is what I call the multicultural real is uh, sort of like which is uh, borrowing a psychoanalytic term, which which is the idea that well there is the uh, obvious pluralization of the Australian nation, and 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 the more the Australian nation is pluralized, the more the fantasy becomes a protective uh, fantasy that shields. The fantasizer from certain realities rather than being grounded yeah. uh, in dominant uh, dominant realities. So I totally agree with you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are there any question, other questions? I see in the chat that Christine is asking. Thank you very much for the talk. Will there be an online launch of the book, the new book? Um, I guess it's already you know, <laughs> a presentation of the book, but are you planning any online? event that is launching the book? Yes, uh, the book, the, actually the book is um, going to Australia uh, next week. Uh, the book is being launched as, at the Sydney Writers' Festival. And uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, quite, a, quite an interesting uh, celebration of it. As far as you know, it was going to be also broadcasted online. It's going to be just an in-person event or there will be an online possibility to uh, there will be there will be there will be a a launch online at the University of Melbourne on the thirty first of of May. Thank you. If you want to share the link, I can share it with the people that are in in the room. Thank you very much, um, Kassan. Uh, thank you. I will send it to you. Any other question or comments? Uh, last comments. Last question. Right, Gassan, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Michael and I and all the people that are here are great fan of your work. So looking forward to read again what will happen next in the third part. We are familiar with the first part and the second part. So you get the book and see what is in the, in the, yeah. Thank, thank you very much and thank you. Thank to, you. Uh, to everybody thank you. was here. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Bye. Same here. Thank you.